Hey, how you guys doing? Welcome back to another episode of Soldiers Talk, the podcast. I'm your host, Staff Sergeant McPherson, and on this show, we discuss military topics with current and prior service members. Today, uh, I have a special guest with me. I have Sergeant Coon with me. How you doing, man? I'm good, Tan. How you doing? How everything been going today? Oh, pretty good. Just, you know, just a normal day at the office. Been busy. Yeah, pretty good. Okay, uh... Kind of uh, introduce yourself to the people. Let them know, like, who you from and where you from and stuff like that. So, originally, I'm from Cameroon. That's in Africa. It's a country in, in Africa. Um, I moved from Cameroon to Thailand before coming to the U.S. I was in Thailand for about five years. Then in 2018, uh, so December 13, 2018, I moved to the U.S., where I've been here since then. Then, in my wife's been here all along. My wife is here. She's been here a little over ten years. And I'm married, like I just said, with three kids. Uh, two boys and a girl. And then twenty eight in twenty nineteen, I decided to join the army. And my wife didn't. She didn't like the idea because they have that. She had that conception that uh, when you join the army, you go to war. You you might they might shoot you, might die, and things like that. So I tried to convince her because when I looked at the army, it was the only one of the best profession that would stabilize us as a family, and my kids and my wife. Because she was going to school and she was working as a CNA, and that was not really bringing income and. Me too. I just got here. I was really not, I didn't really have a good job. So we were just managing. So I decided to join the army. So it took me like a year to convince her because I didn't want to force it. And in 2020, she just said she, she accepted that I joined the army and, and everything is, everything else is just a pass. So yeah. Okay. So uh, growing up, where you grew up at? Uh, like I said, I grew up in Cameroon, in Africa. My elementary school, college, and everything was back in Cameroon. Okay, so tell me how was it? Well, how was it growing up there? Like, explain like the environment and how was it and stuff like that. Yeah, it's a it's a big contrast compared to here. Back home, it's a you know, it's a developing country. So, growing up, going to school, you have to trek, walk from home to school. Like every morning, I walk back from home. There is no, you, my parents were not rich. So, we didn't have a car that they would go drop me off at school. So, I would just get ready for school. They would say, go. I take, I get out. I meet my friends. We just walk, we talk, and walk to school. Same thing when we get out of school, and that was how it was from my very at at the age of five, right down to when I I graduated from my university when I got my bachelor's degree. It was trekking from home to school, and like I said, it's a developing country, so. Paying my tuition was my parents' responsibility right up to, say, grade, uh, say grade five. Then during vacation, like summer holidays, we have just summer holidays, three months every year. I will leave from where I was born, which was like in the suburbs. I will go to the, to the economic capital, which is Douala in Cameroon. I'll go there and I will hawk around, like buy stuffs and sell to sell to walk around, sell them, make some money. By the time I'm going back, I'll have my t shirt, I'll have I've bought my books and things like that. That's how I grew up. That's how I went to school, right down to where I graduated from university. So my secondary school or my that's what I would call it back home, secondary school. That's like a high school. I was taking care of myself and taking care of my siblings because I'm the first. So I will go to go go out, hustle, 
bring back money that will pay my tuition and my siblings' tuition. I'm going to buy them books that they will need, textbooks and all that. And that, that's how it was until I got to the university where they were able to go out too and hustle for themselves and, and get their tuition. Even if they don't get all, I will be able to help them buy their books and f- things like that. So, yeah. Okay. So, I kind of want to get into, like, what led you to making the decision to join the, the Army? Like, what, what made you say, okay, I want to join the Army? Once you got to here, yeah. Uh, yeah. What 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 made you to uh, take that decision? Make that decision. So back home, we we know about the American Army. So we have this program back home. We have the recruiters from here that live here and come to Cameroon. They advertise it. If you, we do like a lottery, like a yeah a lottery kind of thing. If you get selected, they will pick you to join the U.S. Army from Cameroon. So I saw that program, then I, w- I, I, w- I, w- I really wanted to join it, but I never got the opportunity to, g- to get selected. So when I came here in 2018, and I had a friend who was already in the army, he had told me, uh, man, if you get here, the army is a really good provision for you to get started. And it will stabilize your family and all that. So my aim was to start IT. So... I decided to join the army because of what my friend had told me, the benefits, the the stabilization of my family, uh, the health care benefits. That was uh, one of the main reasons I wanted to give my wife some rest because she was going to work during the day and going to work at night. So I wanted to give her that break. So I joined the army. She would take care of the kids. She can only do like one job, like, just do day job rather than or night rather than going day and night and I mean it's tiring. So the main reason was to stabilize my family. Yeah. I got you. Mm-hmm. So when you first went to the recruiter, what was the MOS you chose? Like what what uh what did you choose any kind of MOS or how did that go? That's a very good question. Um so when I I joined during COVID. So I contacted the recruiter over the over email. So they reached out to me and I took the ASVAP one on one in the recruiter's office. And I did not know that I was that was the ASVAP they were gonna record. So when I took the ASVAP, because he said I should try, I should just try it and see how, how what I was called. So I scored an uh, eighty two percent. He was, he told me that was good enough. I should I should I should I'm, I'm good. So the MOS I picked when I went to when he gave me he gave me I I picked sixty eight whiskey. That was a combat medic. And at that time I did not know what it was. I did not know the kind of jobs that the army offered. I had I had no prayer knowledge what I was doing. But then. Because he had been to my house and saw, me, saw that I was a family man. He told me that combat medic is good, but I'm going to be deploying a lot. That's why he told me. But then he, he recommended that I take that MLS because it was for two and a half years. So I was on a long contract. So he told me it was two and a half years. So I took that, reserved it, and not signed it. So when I reserved it, it, uh, it was reserved for two weeks. So I joined from Maryland. So when I, by the time I went to MEPS in Maryland to sign for my MOS, they told me that it was t- somebody took it away, that you, you cannot reserve uh, an MOS for, for two weeks. It's only one week. So that led to the change of my MOS from 68 whiskey to a 68 golf. And it was a hot battle because I want to say my recruiter, re- he looked out for me. When I told him that they had taken my MOS, he said, what do they have? They told me 11 Bravo. He told me logistics and all that. He said, don't take those MOS. It's going to take you away from your family. So he recommended 68 Juliet and 68 Gov, that those are the MOS I should take. They did not have 68 Juliet. They did not have 68 Gov. He said, if they don't have those, don't take anything else. 
So I told them that they won't let me go. So they had to make a call to the headquarters. I'm in headquarters in Virginia. It was a 25 minutes call and they were not answering. And at the 25 minutes, they answered. They told him that they have they have a 68 guard. So I called my recruiter back while I was in the map in maps that they have 68 guard. He said, "Yeah, take it." So in my mind, my friend had told me that they give uh, bonuses. So I asked him, "Is there a bonus for that 68 guard?" Because at that time it was a staff sergeant. So he said, "No, there's no bonus." So that his decision again came in. I called my recruiter again and said, "No." Not every MOS has a bonus, and it depends on the need of the army. So ju- just take it. That's why I took six A Gov Mission Administration Specialist. Six A Gov. Yeah. And what's this? Can you tell the people what the six A Gov is? So a six A Gov is a Mission Administration Specialist. So basically, what you do, like say you are, you work at a hospital. You're basically like a clerk in the hospital. So you take them, take input, uh, put input, put in people's information in the the system, and you help the doctor and all that direct the, the patient where they need to go when the doctor uh, when when they are, the doctor needs them put in the information and just yeah just tracking things like that. I got you. So I'm gonna say, uh, when did you go to basic training? My basic training started on the August fourth, twenty twenty. You said where? August fourth, twenty twenty, okay. in Fort Lena Wood, Missouri. Okay. Uh. Going to basic training, like, how was that for you? I know it was something new. So tell me about your experience in basic training. Like, It was new, really new. It was a different experience to me. And the most thing that I came here in 2018, and my, I'm not young. I was, at that time, I was 30-something years old. So when I got to basic training, I got there at night, around say 11, 11 p.m. They started COVID te- testing. We had to be out there in the cold. COVID testing. After COVID testing, we went for clothing, cl- cl- uh, clothing to issue clothes. It took us all night, and I'm not, I'm, I'm not used to that kind of treatment. So it was, it was. Really, really strange to me because nobody told me that that's what, what was going to happen. So it was strange to me. I almost reacted like, why are they treating people like we are animals, things like that, because <laughs> it was really cold. Yeah. So I was like, I'm not used to this kind of training. This We are human. Why are they treating us like this? Uh, there, there was this one 18-year-old uh, male out there. He told me, hey, bro, you need to, you need to calm down. I've heard a lot about what is going on here? So, you can get kicked back. They can send you back from here. So you just calm down. Make sure we get this process over. And that's how I just relaxed and we got a clothes issue. Then went back to the barracks where we were going to be the company. We slept at six as six a.m. From that we were up all night and slept at six a.m. By zero eight we were up. Yeah, going through basic training, you know, like I said, I'm an, I, I was old at that time, and seeing the way 18 years old were behaving, I was getting smoked because of 18 years old misbehaviors. So I was really pissed off about that. And in my platoon, they knew me. They knew, I, t- I always mentioned my age to them that they should, like, take care. Not, I, I'm not used to all this training. I don't want to get smoked because of somebody. And I was really vocal. Not vocal in the, in the sense that I, will, I was talking, like talking all the time. I was like, I don't know why you, a discipline master? Like, I would discipline the class, uh, the, the platoon, like my, the, the soldiers in my class, the 18 year old, because they were really messing up. So, Like we had uh, a day where a soldier just turned on the light when it was time to to sleep. They dress in. I said, everybody goes to bed. Then I was at like zero at twenty one hundred. So when I turned on the light, I just shouted. We got smoke all night. They brought up sand, throw sand in the bay. 
and everybody were, we are up in the push up position sweating like all night as i said all night we had, we had to clean the bay of the sand the sand they throw dress and throw sand and water the bay we had to clean it that night mm-hmm. so the next day i caution that oh, that's that's kind of person i am that's how i grew up back home <laughs> yeah. yeah that's how i grew up back home so i called a soldier i caution i caution i say see I understand that's your culture, but that's not my culture. You understand? But why here you're not, not a, you're not gonna get us into trouble because of your stupidity. Mm-hmm. Next time when you do that, I don't. I know you guys will go and report to the drill sergeant. We, I don't go to the drill sergeant. I'm gonna hold you, man to man. We're gonna fight up. Yeah, yeah. That's <laughs> how, yeah. That's how, that's exactly what I told him. I said I'm gonna fight you if you make any mistake again in this way. He thought I was joking, so. This issue of farting in, in the bay, you just come a little you fart the yeah, the camera fart in, in your in your in your long space. Bay, just, yeah. You mess around and you just come out fart in your space. They it, do it on purpose. <laughs> they do it on purpose. So he came he, I have this soldier uh Hod. It was a we saw was a PFC, Hod. I still remember his name. He was a he was a combat medic. So he had a habit of farting all the all over the place. So I told him that See, I know it's funny to you guys. It's not funny to me. And mind you, I wasn't the oldest. I had one guy that was older than me too. At that time, I was like 33 when I joined, be- joined 33. So I told him, I'm not that kind of person. In this bay, you either respect yourself or I'll make you respect yourself. So after some like two good two weeks in the bay, we had yeah, I was in second platoon. Everybody in the platoon knew who I was, because it's not like I was vocal. I was just somebody. I I was very reserved. I only came up when I wanted to, like. When you had your discipline in the, in the bay, so they pretty much knew me. And the one thing that really made them made me stand out was that I was good at pity. My whole bay, I was good at PT, and I was uh, the best in my bay at that time. Because I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm a gym addict, so I, before I went to bed, I was ripped. So when this we did a, a pre-diagnostic, I would so I was I was first in class. So I had a group of soldiers that came around me and we were all working out together like every now and then. So they, when I speak, I had people that will back me up. They will say, oh, hey, man, be careful. So he's coming speaking. So that's how we went on. Though we had issues, but guess what? We handled it. Pretty much. I handled it because my platoon, was my, my platoon, second platoon was the best at the end of the uh, end of the, uh, our cycle. Okay. Yeah. So when you got to your first duty station, what was your first duty station after basic and AIT? So, this is my first duty station after I got out from AIT, uh, basic on AIT, uh, 44 Medical Brigade, HSC. And that's, I've uh, been here over, a little over two years. So, yeah. Okay, so when you first got here, uh, did you have like a sponsor, anything, showing you around and stuff like that? That's a very good question. So, you know, in AIT, you have to go into the ACT tracker and look for your spawn, communicate with your, with your sponsor. So I did that and, but I never got back, a response back from my sponsor. So I just came here like that. So he later contacted me when I was already on my way to here. He got my number. When I was at the airport about to board to come here, he called me, say, hey, Mr. Viscombe, this is, so, so, so I'm going to be a sponsor. I know you, you email me, but yeah, I'm going to be a sponsor. So on my way here, I already knew that he was going to pick me up at the airport. I got you. Yeah, so when I got here, we were not allowed to be picked up by POV. So we had a bus, took us to reception. So I told him I, w- I was going to be at the reception. They, dro- they dropped me off at the reception. He came and met me there. And at that time, he was in, in VOC. He was attending his VOC. So, mm-hmm. when I came here, he 
show me around. I in process with S one and all that. Yeah, he showed me around. He told me what what I needed to do and things like that. And he was, I want to say he squared me away because at that time he has bought it, he just bought his house and he was like, since you're here, you're a specialist, you're married. Then I want you to within this time frame, I want you to buy a house. Don't stay in the, don't stay don't stay in the apartment for too long. So yeah, within say six months, he really helped me out and I bought a house within that time frame. So yeah. I got you. So leadership, I want to get into leadership. So uh, from Sergeant Coombe, what is a good leader to Sergeant Coombe? What what qualities do they have? What do they do? Who, who Explain them as what type of leader. What is a good leader to you? Um, a good leader to me, I, like I, I've been here two years, little about two years, and I've seen a lot of, Leadership. I work in the S three shop, where you have all those uh, uh, officers, majors, and all that, and E servants. A good leader to me, like I always say, I always tell people that before we, we before we became uh, soldiers, before we are soldiers, we are human. So. A good leader to me is somebody who has compassion. Forget, I I just um, forget what the um, the uh, army defines leadership. I'm not. I'm not saying that that's ir- irrelevant. It's relevant. I'm just saying, as a person dealing with other people, you need to have a compassion. You need to be listen to your soldiers' cries and be ready to direct them. Motivate them, not only to accomplish what you're telling them, but to also help build them up from what you expect or what you see that will benefit them, not only in the military, but when they get out of the military and back home. So a good leadership is somebody who follows up. If you set goals for your soldiers, you need to follow up those goals. Constantly checking in on your soldiers, not only when they when, when they're reporting to work, but on their families too. It's a when you, when you say a good leader, it's it's a it's a very broad topic. But when you have compassion, I think that's it says it all about you. That you can lead with compassion. If you don't have compassion, I don't see how you you will be able to 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 persuade somebody to into, into doing something. That will be to the benefit of the unit, or uh, to accomplish a mission. I got you. So uh, you guys has kind of met Sergeant Coom. Uh, you got to know his background, uh, some of his experiences and stuff like that. Uh, make sure you guys follow the podcast on Instagram, Facebook, YouTube at Soldier Talk the Podcast. Uh, make sure you guys go to Amazon and purchase my book. Uh, you can just search for DeAndre McPherson, and uh, my book should come up growing up in the Army. Uh, and, yeah, so this has been another episode. So in closing, Sarah Coom, you got anything you want? You got any type of advice so far as a brand-new soldier coming into the Army? What type of advice would you give them uh, coming into the Army? So, like I said, I never had any... <laughs> Any prayer knowledge, joining the army, picking my MOS, and uh, the advice will give to a brand new soldiers coming into the army. It will be just be yourself and uh, respect yourself and uh, respect each other, respect your your leadership. I mean, if you respect yourself and respect your leadership, it's going to take you to high height. And yeah, no, no, what. Why you join the uh, join the army, and set your goals and make sure you achieve them. Yeah, that's all. Advise them too. Okay, so this has been another episode of Soldier Talk the podcast, and I'll see you guys at formation. Mm-hmm.